So that's coming up in May, and then a couple weeks after that on May 18th, 19th, and 20th, we'll have our Prophecy Conference with, uh, with David Hawking, and um, we've got some flyers that are being uh, printed up even as we speak, and uh, we'll uh, be trying to get the, the word out through K-Light and so forth, but I encourage you to use that as an opportunity. There's just a few things happening in the Middle East these days, <laughs> and, uh, and so it, uh, it might be a good time for... Um, Maybe a friend or a family member that is more than just curious as to what the Bible says about the Middle East and what's happening there to uh, invite them out to hear uh, David, who truly is an expert uh, in the field, and, um, uh, and it'll be a great time. So uh, May 18th, 19th, and 20th, so I uh, encourage you to uh, plan on that, but uh, be in, in prayer for that as well. And then there's a, a newsletter from the, uh, the Takamoris, uh, from, uh, again, they're, they're there. Yeah, at Calvary Chapel Fuchu, uh, they're they're thinking uh, uh, about a, a year. Mike took a leave of absence, and they're they're working. And if you read the newsletter, um, Don's been teaching uh, in the uh, preschool, and now they're going to shift. And the two of them are going to be uh, overseeing their after-school program. It has a lot of kids in it, so uh, uh, they could certainly use your uh, your prayers. But uh, they're they're doing doing well. All right. Well, Esther chapter 3, if you want to open your Bibles and, and uh, turn there. Uh, and as uh, we are going through our study in Esther, I had mentioned that uh, every week I would uh, try to introduce you to uh, a modern day uh, Esther, and, uh, which we did last week with uh, Rosa Parks, who um, uh, made such a, a huge uh, impact, uh, like Esther, who's uh, been uh, given a platform uh, Esther now has become the, the queen, and I, and I hope that we at least kind of uh, got a, a better sense or idea of uh, what transpired there. You know, we kind of ro- romanticized this idea that, um, oh, the poor king, he has somehow, you know, managed to lose his wife, or the poor guy, uh, and so now there's this beauty contest, and everybody tries out, and she's the most beautiful, and she wins. Uh, that's, that is not accurate at all. Uh, Xerxes was a, a brutal guy. Uh, he was a drunk. Two things the history writes about him and writes extensively. He was absolutely an immoral person and he was a drunk. That's what we remember uh, by and large about uh, King Xerxes. Powerful, powerful man. And uh, these women are rounded up against their will and they are, they are brought into the capital. And they are... They live a life of luxury, uh, and after a year of preparation, uh, they go before the king, and as you read the text, you get the sense it's a little more than, uh, than uh, dinner and dancing. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, fortunately, Esther is, uh, is chosen, but uh, uh, this, this is probably not exactly the thrill of her life for this uh, good Jewish girl uh, to be married to uh, a pagan king. He was a very uh, immoral man. He's into astrology, Zoroasterism, and all this other stuff. And he's got several other concubines uh, bes- besides her. Uh, she probably, uh, at some juncture, is wondering, uh, doing a lot of "Why me, Lord?" and "Why now?" and "How could you know? <laughs> uh, how could you put me in such a predicament?" But it, you also have a sense that she probably had to. Uh, maybe be wondering, her and Mordecai, because he's been elevated. He has a place at the city gate, which means he's a leader. He's a government official now. He's one of the judges uh, of the city. Uh, he's been elevated. Uh, and uh, uh, they have to be thinking uh, that uh, uh, this is more than simply good fortune, that, uh, that actually perhaps God has placed them there for a reason uh, and for a purpose. Uh, and when we when we see people like that uh, in history, like Rosa Parks and others, uh, it's um, who yield themselves over in those difficult circumstances to whatever God has for them. Uh, it's amazing what God can do. Uh, the example I wanted to uh, give you this morning is um, a little Polish lady named uh, Irina Sindler. And I think I've got a couple of uh, pictures of, of her. You know, I didn't... Uh, most of the world did not know who Irina Sindler was until uh, four high school girls uh, from a rural town in Kansas City researched her out in, and, uh, in a study about the Holocaust and about her life and heroics and what she did. Uh, they wrote a play about her. They performed it. 
and as they say <laughs> in the vernacular today, it went viral, and suddenly the world learned about Irina Sindler. She was a, uh, a nurse, uh, a social worker, uh, and, uh, and a Christian. And during the uh, Nazi occupation of Poland, when the Jews were being rounded up and put into what we know the term today is the ghettos, uh, where they would hold them until they were taken on trains to death camps, Irina Sedler uh, decided she could get in as a nurse and as a social worker, and as she did, she realized that there were many little children and babies even that were going to die a horrible death unless she did something, and so she began to smuggle them out with her in, in cartons and baskets. Uh, she would have her dog with her who would bark on cue going through the guard stations in case the baby cried and so forth. And then she kept records of these children, their names, their Jewish names. She gave them new Gentile names. She placed them in, in homes all, all over Poland and kept track of every one of them in case their parents would survive somehow the death camps. They could be reunited later. And over a course of time, she saved over 2,500 children. There's a, it's a great story and it's a wonderful, there's a, there's a great movie about her as, uh, as well. She was eventually found out and uh, arrested by the Gestapo. Uh, she was tortured uh, to try to give up the names of her uh, folks that she works with in her organization, as well as uh, the children and their names and where they were located, and she never, she never would. Uh, she was sentenced to death, but uh, they were able to raise enough money to bribe a guard and get her out and, uh, and get her free. She changed her name, her identity, and went back doing the same thing again <laughs> and, uh, and saving more children. It's a wonderful story. Uh, she's an, a modern-day Esther. Uh, God gave uh, her a vision and a platform, and she could do something, and so uh, she did. This is um, uh, a picture in uh, Israel, uh, it, uh, and it's at uh, Yad Vashem. We'll talk about that more, the Holocaust Museum Memorial that is uh, there in Jerusalem, uh, and there is a place... Uh, um, going into the museum where there are trees planted called the Trees of the Righteous. Uh, and there's a tree there in honor of Irina Sindler, others like Oscar Schindler uh, and so forth, others that did what they could to try to help uh, the Jewish people during the time of the Holocaust. It was interesting. Uh, we were sitting in front of this tree, my brother and I, uh, the last time that uh, uh, we, were, we were there, and uh, he looked and saw the, the, the placard, Irina Schindler. Oh, wow, this is her tree. Let's take a picture. I didn't even know the story. And then he told me the story, and I had to later go back and uh, read more uh, about it. But uh, modern-day Esthers, they're all around us, and we'll continue to point others out. But again, there's, uh, the spiritual climate in, Eth in Esther is, is not a good one for the Jewish people. Uh, remember, 40 years prior... Ezra went back with only about 60,000 Jews. Cyrus, and we'll talk more about him in a moment, gave them permission to go back. Another Persian king, they are back and have rebuilt the, the temple. The walls remain in rubble. And after Esther, 40 years later, uh, another king will reign. Uh, and um, uh, he, his cupbearer bearer will be a man named Nehemiah who will get permission to go back and re rebuild the, the wall. But Esther and, uh, uh, and Mordecai have been placed uh, in uh, prominent positions now. And uh, now there will be a plot that will emerge uh, to have the Jewish people destroyed. And that's going to come from the villain of the story, this man Haman or Haman or Haman. And we'll, we'll see uh, him now. So first we're seeing, we're in chapter 3, that Haman is elevated to a, uh, a new position. Uh, after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them that they told it to Haman 
to see whether Mordecai's words uh, would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. So a new respect uh, to be shown to Haman. And uh, notice uh, the second half of verse 1, he's advanced him, uh, set him above all the princes. So the 127 uh, nation uh, states that make up this kingdom, all the way from North Africa, all the way across to northern uh, India. And now Haman is kind of the king's right, right-hand right guy. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, huge deal. Uh, we'll also note that uh, uh, Esther has been queen for about four years now. Uh, we'll, we'll have a, a reference to that uh, later. So some time uh, has passed. Uh, Mordecai's been there as a city uh, official for a period of time. She's been the queen uh, for four years at least. Uh, and now Haman has been uh, elevated. Uh, and Haman certainly is, uh, is no dummy. He's probably a very mim- manipulative type guy. And we'll, we'll see that in the text as we... Uh, continue on in our study through the weeks, uh, but uh, we should assume that he's a pretty smart guy, that he's a very highly skilled uh, administrator in order to reach this position. Uh, he also may have been uh, very, very wealthy. What we do know from history, again from the Persian Chronicles, is there were four primary families that were incredibly wealthy uh, during this kingdom. Uh, we'll see later in the text that when he su- makes the suggestion uh, to exterminate and kill all the Jews. Again, it's not just in Persia, it's, it's the entire kingdom. Uh, when he makes that suggestion, uh, he offers to put up uh, 10,000 talents of, of silver. There's a couple of possibilities. Uh, one of them is that he's from one of those families, a very, a very smart guy, a powerful guy, uh, and now he's been uh, elevated to uh, a very high position. It's interesting because the, uh, at the end of chapter uh, 2, we read how, and Mordecai saved the life of the king, right? He, under, he heard the plot uh, of the two gatekeepers, uh, and he lets Esther know. Uh, he, uh, she lets the king know. Uh, these guys are uh, hung on the gallows, and the, the gallows is not like a western gallow. The gallows is a, a pole with a spike at the top of it. That's, that's what they're hung on. And... Uh, uh, and uh, the king is saved. So Mordecai saves the king's life, but he's not the guy that gets promoted. And that's called, life is not fair, <laughs> and life is full of evil uh, at, uh, at times. Uh, and certainly, uh, we experience that living in a fallen world. Second thing uh, about this promotion is that Mordecai refused to acknowledge Haman's new position uh, there in verse 2, but Mordecai would not bow or pay a homage. It's not that Mordecai had a bad attitude. It's just that he was Jewish. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, he's taken this, uh, uh, this uh, Persian name, uh, a name uh, after a Babylonian god, Marduk. And we uh, mm-hmm. talked about uh, uh, his Persian name can be found in, the, in those records as Marduka uh, in Hebrew Mordecai. Uh, but at this juncture, for whatever reason, now Mordecai kind of exposes the fact that, uh, that he's, uh, he's Jewish. Uh, there's a document from the uh, Alexandrian Jews from about 100 B.C., much later, a uh, rabbi's writing, uh, and they have a quote from, uh, from Mordecai, uh, which, again, we can't verify in Scripture, but basically they have Mordecai saying that uh, he would not bow down or pay homage because he would never give the glory that was only deserving to God to a man. But that's basically it. Uh, no idols. Well, he was a living person, but still as a Jew to bow, to literally bow down as in worship and pay homage. Uh, Mordecai uh, wouldn't do it. Uh, notice verse uh, 3 in the middle there. Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily. So uh, every day they're like, uh, Haman's going by and everybody is, is bowing. Uh, to him, except one guy that refuses to do it, and they're they're like, "What is up with with that? Are you crazy?" And uh, and they're why why won't you bow down every day? That's the same the same thing. Uh, and some of them may not have been a fan of Haman, and some of them may have been thinking, "Yeah, I don't have the guts to do that, but I don't blame him because that guy's a jerk or whatever." Um, uh, th- that's uh, implied a little bit in verse four. In the second half when it says, uh, And they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. 
It's like, is he going to get away with this? Maybe some of them are hoping he will get away with this, but they're kind of waiting to find out. So this is going on for a period of time. They keep questioning him. Why won't you bow down? Are you crazy or what? So he finally, he tells them the reason, and it's because he's a Jew, and he would not uh, uh, give the honor to man uh, that was only deserving to God. Now, he may have also, if he knew his genealogy and his history, as most Jewish people do, uh, he may have also realized that he was, as we saw last time, he was in the lineage of the son of Kish. Remember, there was another famous Israelite, the son of Kish. His name was Saul. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, this is Haman the Agagite. Uh, he is a descendant uh, of King Agag uh, and was an Amalekite, therefore. Uh, and uh, their history, at least generationally, goes back uh, and, uh, in terms of conflict. Remember, Saul was supposed to uh, execute uh, King Agag. Uh, he, uh, Samuel had to do it on his behalf, but obviously he had some family members that, uh, uh, that, uh, that survived. But the declaration of Mordecai, uh, he had to realize that he was putting his job on the line just by simply declaring he was Jewish. Uh, he also may have realized that it could cost him his life. He, had, he has no idea the implication that this could cost the lives of every Jewish person all the way, you know, and basically in the world at that time. Uh, but, uh, uh, but he had to be thinking that uh, it would cost him, cost him something. With the, um, uh, this last week was, uh, you know, the Holocaust uh, 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 Memory Day, uh, and, uh, which is uh, important. And we'll talk about it just a little bit in terms of examples. I read one statistic that 40, almost 40% 40 of millennials, when questioned, didn't even know what the Holocaust was. So it's, it's, it's a good thing they have the museums, and it's a good thing uh, that they have a Remembrance Day, and there's been uh, some good things in the news. And I saw a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, documentary uh, on PBS the other night about... Uh, all of the GIs that, uh, that served that were, were Jewish. Uh, and uh, one of the things that was interesting is on their dog tags, your dog tag, of course, your, your name, your serial number, and it would be stamped. I don't know if it still is, but in World War II, it would be stamped uh, either with a P for Protestant, uh, C for Catholic, or H for Hebrew. Uh, and the guys fighting in Europe that were Jewish were pretty much told, if you think you're going to get captured, you rip your dog tags off and throw them away. Because if the Nazis capture you and see the H for Hebrew, they'll kill you right on, right on the spot. Uh, it's, not a, it's still a dangerous thing in a lot of places in the world to reveal your identity as being Jewish. Uh, it may cost you a bit uh, to, if you reveal... Uh, on your job, the fact that you are a Christian. We used to have uh, one of the guys in the church that held uh, uh, a very high uh, state government position. And uh, he was very influential. Uh, and uh, he had told me at one time that um, uh, if he revealed the fact that he was a Christian, he would probably lose his job. Uh, e either that or he would be ignored at that point in terms of <coughs> the advice, legislation he was writing, uh, and, uh, and various things. Uh, and uh, so he, he was kind of like this uh, under-the-radar Christian, uh, doing what he could for the sake of righteousness uh, through the position he had, uh, but unable uh, at that time, later he was, but uh, at that time to even reveal the fact that he was, uh, he was a Christian. We're not in any kind of the position that the Jews were in ancient Persia, but we certainly have reached a time where uh, it's, it's very interesting that uh, you can be discriminated against, uh, take some heat, take some flack, simply for identifying yourself uh, as a person of faith. Uh, so Haman, he's elevated to a new position. Mordecai refuses to bow down, and now, for whatever reason, uh, he's chosen to uh, uh, reveal his identity as being Jewish. This, uh, secondly, we note that Haman is enraged at Mordecai. Not just him, but the Jewish people. That's in verse 5 and 6. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for he had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews 
who were throughout the whole kingdom of Hazarus, the people of Mordecai. So this thing is certainly uh, escalated. Uh, notice Haman's enraged when he hears, and that's where it all begins. Uh, it begins with uh, anger, uh, and uh, and of course uh, for Haman, uh, this was something that was uh, generational. Uh, this hatred for the Jews. Uh, nobody nobody is born with that. It's taught. You learn it uh, uh, in uh, in in the home, uh, and uh, that's where uh, prejudice comes from. And uh, and uh, certainly we, uh, uh, we see it here. Secondly, he's uh, enraged as he plans to destroy, uh, again, not Mordecai, but all the Jewish people. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole uh, kingdom. And again, uh, well, that seems like a little overreaction there. The, the one guy won't bow down. Okay, I'm going to kill several million people across the world as a result of that. So obviously, uh, Haman is... Uh, uh, a man who has uh, had been uh, anti-Semitic and a hatred, had a tremendous hatred for the Jewish people for some time, uh, and probably just waiting for the opportunity to uh, to do something like this. And we're reminded again uh, that he is the son of Hamadat <coughs> Atha, uh, the Agagite. And uh, and again, we kind of went through that story of 1 Samuel 15 in an earlier passage. Back in Deuteronomy 25, <coughs> verse 17 words uh, to Joshua in going into the land, uh, God tells him this, remember what Amalek, these, uh, and again, uh, that's who uh, Agag is, he's, uh, he's an Amalekite, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God has given you to possess as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalekite uh, from under heaven uh, you shall not forget. Uh, the rear ranks, who is that? That was the elderly, uh, that was the disabled, uh, those were the people that were sick, that's who they attacked. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't confront Joshua and the army. Uh, they just snuck around behind uh, and killed uh, the most uh, defenseless people. That's what the Amalekites did. Uh, and God said to Joshua, Hey, once you've taken the land, you've gotten situated, you remember these guys and then, then go deal with them uh, as, uh, as a result of that. And that is what uh, was supposed to have been carried out by King, Agat, or by King Saul, uh, that he never completed the, uh, uh, the mission. But again, uh, what uh, uh, King Agag, the Amalekites, nor Haman counted on was uh, a promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2, where God promised Abraham and, the, and his physical descendants. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth are blessed through uh, his descendant, Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, his name has been great. The Jews have been multiplied. Uh, this is an eternal, unconditional promise given to him. Uh, and it's still true today. And it's a fascinating thing to study history, whether you're looking at Napoleon or whoever you're studying, and see, and see their prosperity when they were friendly to the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and what happened when they turned against them uh, to their own, uh, own demise. And, uh, and so that, uh, that promise is still in effect today, uh, that uh, uh, certainly the Lord has blessed our country, uh, and, uh, and uh, at times more than others, and one of the reasons is because how we've dealt with uh, the Jewish people uh, and do, done our best to be an ally of them. Uh, but uh, God makes uh, good on his promises down through the ages. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 54, 17 uh, of Israel, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, uh, says the Lord. And um, again, uh, there's been uh, many attempts to persecute and eliminate the Jewish people, uh, all uh, very unsuccessfully, obviously. 
Uh, and as we come up to May 14th uh, here uh, in a few weeks, uh, the modern state of Israel will be celebrating their 70th uh, anniversary. But uh, Haman goes from uh, a discussion about what to do and enraged over one Jew, Mordecai, uh, and his final conclusion by the time he thinks it through is I will utterly destroy uh, each and every Jewish person that I can possibly get my hands on. A similar conversation was held uh, by Otto Adolf Eichmann and 15 others as Hitler gave them uh, the uh, quest to deal with the Jewish problem. And at the time, they thought about killing some of them. There were discussions about that. There are detailed records of this uh, conversation and all that Hitler did. Uh, but by the end of the day, this group of 15 men decided that the way to end the Jewish problem was to exterminate every Jew uh, in Europe that they could get their, their hands on. It starts out with, what should we do with a few? It ends with, we will destroy all. Uh, it happened here in the reign of Xerxes. Uh, it's, uh, it happened uh, in, during World War II. Uh, of Eichmann, it said uh, he, at the end of the war that uh, he, he said, he would one day leap laughing into the grave because the feeling that he had five million people on his conscience would be for him a source of extraordinary satisfaction. These guys were demonic. They were absolutely demonic. He fled after World War II, eventually ends up in Argentina where he lives under a different identity until the Mossad and Shin Bet tracks him down, verifies his identity, they go in and basically do a snatch and grab, get him out, take him back to Israel. He stands trial and is uh, executed for his, uh, for his war crimes. Uh, in, in the end, there, there is payday someday, and there's a, a deep place in hell for uh, men like Eichmann. Uh, it is uh, astounding the, the growth of anti-Semitism that uh, is still in the world and is growing today. And the Bible says it's going to get worse before it gets uh, better. Uh, so this story is very, very relevant uh, in men like Haman. So again, he's elevated and then he's enraged. Now the evil plot to destroy the Jews is revealed. That's in verse 7 to 11. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast uh, the purr uh, uh, before Haman to determine the day in the month until it fell on the 12th month, uh, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all the other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they uh, be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the uh, Hamadetha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you. Do to them as seems good to you. So the, uh, the day is determined by, uh, to carry out the uh, evil plot. It's the, uh, verse 7, the first month, which is the month of Nisan. By the way, that's when Passover is celebrated. So as the Jews are are uh, remembering the, their sins and their deliverance and so forth. Uh, a plot is being developed to uh, exterminate them, uh, and they begin to uh, to cast a lot. So uh, we we would uh, it's not dice, but it's like that. It's like the roll of the dice. Again, they're they're into zoroasterism. Uh, they are they're into uh, astrology and all the signs and studying and so forth. Uh, remember that. Uh, the, the wise men followed the stars from Persia to come see uh, the birth of Jesus. Uh, the idea of casting the lots, they were so superstitious that if they were going to do this in attempt to execute the Jews all the way across the kingdom, we'd say the stars had to line up. They were so superstitious, it had to be on the right day, and they ascertained the right day by casting the lot. Uh, they may have done it every day. They may have done it once a week. They may have done it once a month, but it was a process, uh, and it continues here basically for a year before they determine uh, the day. It fell on the 12th uh, of Adar, 
which means they started back in March and, uh, and now it's uh, April the next year uh, and now this plan is going to be executed. Proverbs 16, 13 makes reference to who is controlling uh, the lot. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So there's, uh, there's a year, another year uh, that goes by. Uh, certainly word is getting out uh, of what Haman wants to do. And uh, I don't know, I'm just thinking that might have brought a little bit of a revival in the Jewish community. What do you think? <clears throat> uh, they get word that uh, the most powerful guy uh, in the world, his right-hand man, this guy Haman, the Agagite, uh, the enemy of the Jews, uh, has made a determination. He's gotten permission. He's got the signet ring from the king. He's going to kill every Jewish person, uh, basically from northern India to northern Africa. <coughs> I'm just thinking they might have started a few prayer meetings. I'm just thinking that. Uh, and they had a year to, to do that. And Because, uh, again, the spiritual climate wasn't so great at the beginning of, uh, of this story or at the beginning of the reign of Esther as queen. But... Uh, but I think it might have changed during that period, a period of time. Uh, Ray Stedman's commentary on Esther is called The Queen and I. And he says that the pagan life is one that is driven by fear and superstition. But sometimes what drives it is demonic. And certainly that's, that's what's, uh, what's going on here. <clears throat> but even in this, God is still in control and God is still sovereign. Secondly, the decision is made to destroy the Jewish people. And uh, why, why the hatred for the Jews? And why are they so persecuted? There's been more than one rabbi that has said, if, um, if we are God's chosen people, perhaps he could choose someone else for a while. Uh, because it's, it's been, uh, their life has been wrought with, uh, with persecution. Three reasons why. Uh, they have been the custodians of the word of God. And uh, brought it to us. I uh, kept it, maintained it uh, through the years, and Satan hates the Word of God. Uh, secondly, Jesus, the Savior of the world, is a Jewish Messiah, and Satan hates uh, the Son of God. And three, what brings Jesus back to planet Earth, and when he destroys Satan and all of his evil forces, and Satan knows that, is when the Jewish people in the end cry out, receive Jesus as their Messiah. Uh, Jesus said, looking over the city of Jerusalem, that uh, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until you recognize that, that I'm the Messiah, you won't see me again. Uh, but that time will come. Zechariah 12, 10 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the, ha and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look upon me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Uh, they will do that. That's what ushers Jesus Christ back to planet Earth at the end of what we call the seven-year uh, tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, and we come with him. The church comes with him. We've been with him in heaven during that period. Uh, and we come back and he saves uh, the Jewish people. Hosea 5.15 says, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Uh, then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And that uh, is yet future. And Satan knows that. So if he can destroy them, he can prevent them from crying out, calling out. Many Jews, of course, individually uh, are doing that uh, today and for the last 2,000 years. But we're talking about nationally, corporately, uh, as a nation. Uh, they will do that in the end. Satan believes if he can destroy them, he can keep uh, Jesus from coming back and establishing his kingdom uh, and therefore uh, prevent his own demise. Uh, but in, because Satan throughout uh, the ages has known this, from Pharaoh to Herod, from Haman to Hitler, uh, there's been attempts to destroy uh, the Jewish uh, people. And, uh, and there's another one coming very soon. <laughs> That's predicted by the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel 38, 38, which will not be successful. Uh, it, uh, but again, we, uh, we used to talk about the day that would come when we would see an alliance between Russia, Iran, uh, and Turkey. And, uh, and now they are all together in Syria, uh, and, and they're like 25 miles away from the border. 
uh, of, uh, of Israel. And we just uh, found out uh, yesterday or so that uh, uh, the drone that, uh, that Israel shot down a couple of weeks ago was loaded with explosives. It had a GPS and it was going to a specific target. Uh, it was spotted, it was shot down. Two F-16s, remember, went in, took out the, uh, the base. They launched the drone from, uh, and, uh, and of course, one of those F-16s got, got, got hit on the way back, was able to make it over Israel before uh, they <coughs> punched out, and those uh, had injuries, but those guys were okay. And then about two weeks ago, they followed up with uh, two F-15s uh, going in and uh, destroying uh, the, it's an Iranian military base in Syria, destroying an Iranian military base where they manufacture, were making the drones and weaponizing them for an attack against Israel, and they took that, that base out. And then, of course, uh, President Trump ordered a, a few fireworks there the, uh, the other day uh, to, uh, again, take out their uh, chemical weapons, their R&D places, uh, and so forth. We're thankful for the safety of our uh, men and women during that, that attack as well. But uh, here we are. Ezekiel said there's going to be this war. It's going to take place. Here are the allies. The, Libya will be involved. Kush, there's a few uh, others, and it's, uh, it's all there. But we know that in the end, uh, when it happens, uh, God will destroy two-thirds of the Russian army, uh, and uh, uh, that'll, that'll kind of end the, uh, at least the, the Shiite threat uh, in terms of uh, world jihadis and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, that day, we, we may not see that day, by the way. We, we, we may very well be gone before uh, that, that attack takes place because there's no mention of uh, the United States uh, anywhere when it comes to that. And um, there's only two possibilities. Uh, one, the rapture takes place or something very cataclysmic happens to us and we're no longer a world power. Uh, one, one of the, but something has to transpire that keeps us from uh, being involved in that conflict. But uh, uh, nations, people groups during the years, again, Pharaoh to Herod, Haman to Hitler has tried to destroy the Jews. There'll be another attempt. Uh, third, Haman then makes his case to destroy the Jews. Uh, three things uh, uh, to mention about his plan. Uh, in one sense, one writer said that this is kind of a cover-up. Notice Haman doesn't mention the identity of the Jewish people. Uh, I don't know if you got that in verse 8. Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people. doesn't say who it is. It's a certain people scattered, dispersed among, among the people. He never identifies them as, uh, uh, as being the Jews. And he does that for, for a very good reason. Uh, Xerxes probably wouldn't go along with it if he realized it was the Jews. It's not, not that he loved the Jewish people so much, but there were, there were two prior very famous Persian kings. One is Cyrus uh, and one is Darius. I got this off their Facebook page. So uh, that's, uh, that's Cyrus uh, to uh, your, your, your left, and, uh, and that's, that's Darius on, on, on the right. And, uh, and they were... They were, they were uh, very famous, very popular, and of course, these, these two kings, Cyrus is the one uh, that is actually uh, mentioned uh, in Scripture, uh, and he's the one that, uh, in uh, Isaiah 45, is mentioned by name. He's the one that, that sends Ezra back to, uh, to rebuild, so he, he kind of had a, a favorable, favorable disposition uh, to the Jews, as did Darius uh, as, uh, as well. And so whether Xerxes did or not, we don't know. But either way, it would, have, it would have not probably flown with him. So this is very intentional, just to say. It's intentional by Haman. He doesn't say their name. He just says, oh, there's a certain people, and we need to, uh, to, uh, to deal with them. Notice what, what else he says. Uh, they don't obey the king's laws, which was not true. Uh, they have different customs, which was true. Uh, and then he says, it's in the king's best interest not to tolerate them, but he hides the identity. Secondly, he, doesn't mention, uh, he does mention a great deal of money, uh, 10,000 10, talents of silver. Uh, that would be approximately 375 tons of silver. That's a lot of bags of uh, uh, coins right, uh, right there. Uh, one uh, calculation by one writer said that represented uh, two-thirds of the annual income of the Persian Empire, which, by the way, their monetary, their monetary giving and selling and buying was in silver. 
Uh, and so this was a, uh, a tremendous amount of money, which again goes back to the, okay, does Haman have that kind of money? Was he from one of those four wealthiest families? Uh, or perhaps he's going to get the money from another source. Uh, and that seems to be uh, indicated uh, later in, uh, in verse 13, where it says, uh, And letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. Ah, that's where he's going to get all the money. He's going to get it from the Jews that he is destroying. And that's part of the incentive. Uh, hey, good neighbors, Persians, you go out and kill as many Jews as you want, you could have everything that they own. Well, what did they own? Well, this is a very, uh, very interesting. Just even uh, uh, one, one article. In 1893, there was an archaeological discovery of some cuneiform tablets, the Persian language, <coughs> and, uh, and all about the details of the king uh, Xerxes and his reign. Uh, and in, in those tablets... There's a reference to a man named Marasu, the son of Nippur. He's wealthy, uh, he's a Jewish banker, and he's got a hundred Jewish bankers and agents that work for him all over the kingdom. That guy's got a few bucks right there. Uh, he's just one guy mentioned uh, in history on a cuneiform uh, tablet. So there, there, there are Jews that are, that are prominent uh, and successful uh, in the Persian kingdom, again, which uh, is one of the reasons that only 60,000 went, went back to the hardships, the travel, the hardships, and uh, the attempt to rebuild the temple back uh, in, in their homeland. Uh, a lot of them were pretty well dug in. I mean, they got, they're living in the million-dollar condos, and they're all driving the, the BMWs or whatever. So they're, they're, not, they're not heading back to the desert to live in a tent again. Uh, and uh, that is more than likely where the, I mean, this is a tremendous uh, amount of money where it's going to come from. He's saying that uh, he doesn't mention that it's the Jews. It's just the people dispersed. Trust me on this. You want to get rid of them. By the way, I'm going to give you 10,000, I'm going to get talents, tons of silver by the time this thing is, uh, uh, is over with. And of course, this is not the first time that someone has gone in uh, and killed the Jewish people and then, and then plundered them. In one of our studies right before Easter, uh, we were looking uh, at a, uh, uh, a little teaching documentary filmed in Rome at the Colosseum. And uh, one of the things that was noted about that uh, was the fact that the Colosseum in Rome, which is a, you know an a architect, architectural marvel of a building, it was all built from the, the money from the Jews of Israel because they had been destroyed in 70 AD. All the gold from the temple, all their personal possessions, that's what built the Colosseum. Very, very interesting. I, I don't know if I'll ever make it there or not, but the thing to remember about the Colosseum is that it was built on the blood money of the Jewish people uh, in that uh, it was the place where the Christians were martyred in the first century, torn apart by wild animals to cheering drunk Roman crowds. I, I, I don't know if the blood in the ground still speaks, or you could hear the cries of their voices, but if you could, uh, they would be enormous uh, in terms of what transpired on the Romans in that city. Of course, Hitler did the, the same thing. He plundered the Jews all over Europe, taking their possessions, and people and families are still trying to get their possessions back. There, I just read a case, uh, <clears throat> a court case that was just settled two weeks ago of, of a painting belonged to a Jewish family taken by the Nazis, and it takes them sometimes 10, 20 years in, in court and, uh, and lots of their money just to get a, a family heirloom back because these things are, are worth a lot of money now. They're worth millions of dollars. They hang in museums all over Europe, and they have to fight through the courts if they can get good enough lawyers. And, uh, and there's lots of great stories and, uh, again, a history and a pretty good movie that came out a couple of years ago about one of those cases. Uh, they're still fighting, trying to get their possessions back uh, taken uh, by Hitler, even as Haman intended to do here as well. Lots of parallels, obviously. The third thing, Haman uh, does receive the authority necessary. Uh, that's verse 10, and that's in the signet ring, which uh, 
uh, is uh, this is a radical thing that he would give, he would stamp and give them the signet ring. Of course, that, that stamp and that clay uh, on that order meant uh, it was official, it was authentic, uh, it was, uh, would happen, uh, nothing could, uh, could stop it. And again, you have to wonder, because of the way history paints Xerxes, basically as a drunk, uh, whether he was even in his right mind, or perhaps was drunk when this conversation took place, uh, again, Haman knew what he was doing, seems to be a very manipulative person, uh, and he gives him the royal authority. Uh, again, it's like a, a, a visa card, uh, and uh, uh, boy, once he's got that uh, a signet ring, he can do anything that he, uh, he wanted to. And of course, the, it, meant nothing, it meant nothing to Xerxes uh, to kill uh, millions of people, uh, innocent women and children uh, and babies uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, the king seems quick uh, to uh, dispose of uh, all these lies, never giving it uh, a second thought. That, that is a pagan culture. Uh, in a pagan culture, you don't have a great value placed on, uh, on human life. Uh, and as uh, our own culture has moved further and further away from God and God having a prominent place uh, uh, in our culture, uh, we have become uh, more like that as well. That's why we have abortion. Uh, and people can even argue and somehow ju justify it uh, rather than be ashamed of it. And, and our own legislatures uh, uh, just a few weeks ago signed uh, a euthanasia bill so that if, um, if you're sick and you think you might die, you can just t uh, now just uh, via a doctor uh, take, take, take your own life. Uh, it's, uh, it's a slippery slope. Uh, they've got it in a few states. Uh, in Europe, uh, hor hor horrific things ha have followed because it's it's not just them. It, it's the weak in society. It's the handicapped. It's this. It's the people that are going to cost the insurance companies a lot of money. Let's figure out a way uh, to end their life uh, sooner because uh, human life is, uh, is cheap. The, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned um, the uh, museums that have been set up to remember, to try to help people remember what transpired under Hitler and the one that we show the picture where the tree was there in Israel. It's called Yad Vashim, and uh, we've been there a few times. And the last time we were there, I wrote this uh, uh, quote down when we came, came out. It's, um, it's, it's very moving, to say the least. Uh, uh, and the way the architecture, the interior planning, the way you walk through it, uh, it's just uh, it's very impacting. I mean, you, you, there, there's one room you come around, and it's just a, a massive amount of children's shoes. You know, you, you don't have to see the grotesque pictures that, that are there and available if you want to see them, but just uh, the images that, that you do see are, are, are incredible. And our, our guide, uh, David, uh, said that uh, this is what happens when a nation no longer fears God. And, uh, uh, and boy, the, the world is headed. Uh, and that was the world of, uh, of Esther and Mordecai. Uh, our world is becoming a lot like the 1930s today. Chuck Swindoll said this uh, about Esther and Haman, how absolutely powerless we are to solve our own inner problem of evil. Were not the power of the Holy Spirit given to me in daily doses, literally moment by moment doses, my grudges, my lack of forgiveness could grow into thoughts that would shock you and yours would shock me. That's what happened to Haman. That's why he could devise his wicked plan. That's why he could commit the, this evil without a second thought. He had no inner power from the living God to stop him, to help him get rid of his hatred and his prejudice and live above revenge's powerful grip. And it certainly is powerful. And uh, that, that hatred and that lack of forgiveness and so forth is something we need to be very concerned about. The last thing, the edict is issued, and it's sent throughout the kingdom, verse 12 to 15. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and the decree was written according to all that Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of the king uh, Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring, uh, and the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old. Uh, little children and women in one day on the 13th day, 
the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Sushan, the citadel. For the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Sushan was perplexed. Two different reactions. Just a couple of things uh, about this. Uh, the decree was written. Uh, dispatches were, were sent. Uh, this was uh, no easy task, translating all the languages. Again, we're talking a massive, uh, a massive kingdom, uh, and uh, there's a lot involved here. <coughs> oh, I just had to do it and get it over with. Secondly, it will be uh, a duty of all citizens to, uh, to kill the Jews. Uh, a document, uh, verse 14, was to be issued as a law. Every province published in all people, they should be ready for that day. Uh, and, and again, we, uh, whatever, whatever was thought in the city, whatever was thought in some places by some rulers, uh, there obviously was enough anti-Semitism out there, and Haman knew it. All he had to do is say, you've got permission from the government to kill all the Jews in your community, and you can have all their stuff if you do it. And he knew there would be enough anti-Semitism uh, in the world at that time uh, to, uh, to take care of that, that problem. And of course, this is going to be uh, repeated again uh, during the tribulation uh, period. But notice what the king, king, uh, this is uh, classic and, and, and totally fits with uh, the historical image of Xerxes. Haman and him, what do they do? They sit down and, and drink. And, uh, they get drunk. I mean, it's like, uh, hey, going to kill these several million people? Well, let's have a drink over that. But the city is uh, bewildered. They're perplexed. They're, they're confused as to this order uh, and what's, uh, what's going on. But a time of compromise has ended in the life of Mordecai <laughs> and in the midst of it. And that's what was the catalyst. He decides now is the time to reveal my identity as a believer in God. Um, and, uh, and of course, he's probably wondering, I'm not sure that was really a good idea. But, uh, but he doesn't know the end of the story yet, does he? Uh, and uh, so often we, we struggle with uh, things that are going on in our lives because we don't uh, know uh, the end of the story. Lessons from Haman. Uh, don't underestimate the power of anger, hatred, revenge. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Every year, and we just passed the Feast of Purim, uh, Jewish families all over the world will read the story on, on, the, on the night at sunset when it begins. They'll read the story of Esther uh, all the way through. It doesn't, doesn't take long. And then it's a uh, Kind of a, a, celebra a celebratory time. The, the kids all dress up in costumes uh, and everything. Of course, the little girls all dress up as Esther and, uh, you know, and guys of Mordecai and all that. Uh, and they read the story. And as I, I mentioned, when the, every time the name Haman is said, then they all boo and everything. And they go through the whole, the whole thing. And there's certain foods that they eat uh, and, uh, and everything. And then they get up the next morning and they do the same thing all over again. They read the whole story. Uh, and when asked, uh, why, why read it twice? Uh, it's, and then the reply is so that uh, they will never forget that God delivers his people. And uh, it is a great story of uh, deliverance. And Mordecai becomes a, a Messiah-like figure uh, in, uh, in all of this and his role in it uh, before it's over with. Well, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you uh, have sent us a Messiah and that you do deliver your people. Uh, you deliver us from sin, death, and hell through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, and Lord, we're so thankful for that. Lord, we, uh, we're moved uh, by the story and the fact that it, it had been attempted prior to this in, uh, in history. Uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, there in Egypt. Uh, there would be another attempt uh, by Herod, uh, and there was another attempt ghostly attempt, demonic attempt by Hitler him, himself. And we live in a day when it makes no sense to us. The Jewish people produce the medical wonders that save our lives. They produce the technology that allow us to talk on cell phones and make our life easier. 
you would think the whole world would be beholding to Israel and the Jewish people. Yet we don't find that. And the only explanation is it's a spiritual blindness. And it's the power of Satan that grips so many people's lives. Lord, I do pray that we would guard the wellspring of our heart, Lord, and understand the days that uh, we live in. And uh, be willing to uh, take a stand as Christians for Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, Lord, we don't have to fear being captured by an enemy and being executed because we've got a P on our dog tags. But Lord, um, there could be consequences. So I pray that uh, we'd have the courage, as Mordecai did, uh, to speak for you on your behalf, to tell our stories of your love and your mercy and what you've done in our lives. Because there's a, a dark and evil world, but there's people that you desire to save from it, Lord. So we pray that you would use us to fulfill that mission you've given us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.